Easter Sunday. Well, start thinking about it two weeks from today. We'll be doing a, a, just a, a celebration of Easter where we usually do something that is not with, with layers and layers of intricacy like at times we have in the past, but this one will be uh, some skits. I believe there's five skits and there's five songs that intertwine. And of course, they're going to bring the message of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we'll have a message afterwards and of course, give people an opportunity to make a decision and uh, invite them. I, I do that every Sunday at the end of our message. You have an opportunity to respond. Well, you have to invite people. You automatically say, well, I send out a blanket text to 215 people. I put up a post on Facebook. They should all come. Ah, you need to do that with a little bit more investment, a little bit of love, a little bit of connectivity, and say, hey, I'd love to have you come and sit with me in first service or second service. We're going to have <clears throat> all of our adult groups and everybody meeting like we always do. That way, there'll be plenty of room in here to bring someone in. And you know what? If you come at a certain time, like at 9.02, you might sit up in the front. It'll be so fun. <laughs> aren't these seats great? Right? Well, isn't they the best? See, is the best. Yeah. Rices, aren't they nice seats? These right here, these 10 seats up here, you don't know that I've been hiding a $100 bill under one of them <laughs> for five years and no one's gotten it. And you say, wait a minute, Brownie, we've been moving these chairs around. <laughs> you caught me. But you never know if I see some of you going underneath there. <laughs> this is a lot worth a whole lot more money. In fact, it's just worth eternity for you to come to witness his resurrection. There'll be five different people coming up with some, some lines and a, and a mini drama. And they're going to portray a character that will, again, point to resurrection time 2,000 years ago. And uh, in our study today, we're going to point to Jesus Christ and his resurrection. And we started this series uh, last week called Be Better. In our highlight verses in verse 4, we'll get there in a moment. But I want you to consider again that the book of Hebrews, we preached and taught through it a number of years ago. Bobby taught it in the Bible Institute with the book of James a couple years ago, maybe. And it's a great book. And this series really is birthed out of that of Be Better. We're just doing a, a, a few short weeks here before, of course, May 1. May 1 is our uh, 25th anniversary celebration Sunday, and we'll be out in the sports park. So you can come on out there. And, and uh, did some of you get a postcard in the mail? Yay! And if you go to the uh, FBBC 25 site, which is a kind of a bridge site to our new site that's being developed right now and getting finished up, You'll be able to get all kinds of info on there. There'll be a neat little photo gallery where you can scroll through. And there's a lot of pages on there. And you might be embarrassed by yourself. And other people are going to be embarrassed by you too, you see. But it's okay. There's, uh, there's some neat pictures in there of the last bunch of years of history of what the Lord has allowed us to do. So we are having this little series here. We started last week going through the month of April. We'll incorporate Be Better into our Easter message and our, of course, Resurrection Sunday message. And, and so it's uh, just a neat fit for us. It says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 4, and again, our theme verse, I like to really pray through that and have a verse that we lock into, being made so much better than the angels. I mentioned last week, what a neat phrase, so much better. Not just better, not just much better, so much better. That's like when Grandpas and grandmas see their children and they go, you're so much better than your mother and father. <laughs> it's the best, isn't it? You can just turn to Stacy and go, oh, your children are so much better. But of course, this is the context of Jesus Christ and being better than the angels. And it says in the continuation of that verse, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. That's our highlight verse. We're reminded that Jesus is better than the prophets. Jesus is better than the angels. Jesus is better than Moses and Joshua and the high priests. Where do I get that from? The book of Hebrews. If you study through the book of Hebrews, you'll find that he is better in all areas. It is called oftentimes the supreme acknowledgement or the excellency 
of Jesus Christ. That book is designed by God, by the Holy Spirit. And some say, well, we don't know who the writer is. Um, it's a good chance it's probably Paul. Gosh, I'm upsetting babies again. Praise the Lord. You get used to me. Get used to me. Yeah, it's no problem. Gosh, it sounds like me when I don't get my way. Oh, no, don't take her. Please don't take her. She sounds so beautiful. It's okay. Just goes, you're cool. I love having babies in here. They don't bother me. They bother you? Amen. Babies are wonderful to have around. Now, some of you adult babies, we may have you removed. <clears throat> or you have to go online, watch it online. I have a special room for you. You think it's for the moms. <laughs> it's for you. But Christ is better. He's better than the high priest, and we're going to look at him, Melchizedek, in chapter number 7, better than Abraham. So Jesus is better than and superior to and more excellent than the angels here as we see. But in Hebrews 1, I just want to read verses 1, 2, 3, and 4 once again, just to kind of get you a flavor and a context of where we're at. The series Jesus, Jesus, it's really about him being the one that's going to make you better, to be better in Jesus Christ. What is better to you? Is it that you would top the day that was yesterday so it's better? Would you transcend a place and a position and a condition you have been in to a place that you are new in? Would you eclipse yesterday to be where you're at today with the hopes that tomorrow it might even be better? You think about what it means to be better this series on Be Better is for you and I to look at ourselves and say, you know what? Today is a place where I'm above and beyond the condition I was yesterday, and I'm looking to tomorrow and what the hope in Jesus Christ will bring me for even a better day in him. Not the measure of me being better in health. Physical health is important, but it's not everything. Not me just having a better job or more money or a better bank account. That's important, but it's not what this is about. Be better really is for you and I from the inside out to really see Jesus Christ being the one that will make everything better in our condition, spiritually speaking, that then allows us to handle everything that comes at us because he's going to point us to the word of God. Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 says, God who at sundry times and divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. But here's where he becomes better. Verse number 2, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his prophets, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom all he made the worlds. Verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory, in the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty, capital M, on high. Remember, we did that short series around Christmas time. His majesty. Verse number four, we read again, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Now, we've had a little bit of an introduction. We've had a little time in the word and some beautiful singing. We've prayed a little bit. Let me, let me just pray once again upon our message today for a moment. Father, thank you again for your beautiful word and the reading of your word and, and, and people's attention already. I know that you're already working in people's hearts and minds and their souls and their spirit. And I pray, as you promise, that none of this word of return void, but that it will accomplish all that you would have it to. I pray in the name of Jesus and by the power of the Spirit of God that you would make this word time, this preaching time be fruitful. It would actually maybe alter someone's thinking. It would get them to a place where they would realize they don't, they don't, don't need to settle in life, but rather be better in Jesus Christ. This is our time with you, Father. We regard it as being very, very important. So we want you to do the work. We want you to have your way. We want you to be honored and glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. It says up on the screen, very simply, why settle for less? That's the title of our message today. 
Why would you settle and why would I settle for less? I just mentioned how Jesus Christ, I'm just talking to believers now, talking to you born again believers, you're saying, hey, I know when I called on the name of the Lord to save me, I remember, I know I'm a child of God, I understand what the scriptures say about that, and, and I've grown a little bit, I've grown a lot of bit, I've grown and then I've kind of had my low points, my high points, and sometimes... I can really connect and I can really relate to that statement. Sometimes I've just settled for less. I've settled for less this week and last week and maybe tomorrow. I've settled for just getting by in so many areas. And to be better, I'm going to have to take some medications. To be better, I'm going to have to have somebody take my place or substitute for me in my responsibilities. To be better, I'm going to have to have everything go away, all my problems and difficulties so that I can be okay. And I understand that approach. I do. I, I do. I'm not discounting that. But that kind of life can perpetually haunt you. Because you may get to a point in life where you say, I've just settled for less in my life. I started to do that. And maybe it's time just to repent and say, I'm going to put down that idea of settling for less in this life because I'm born again. I'm a child of God. I have surety in him. I am valued by the Father in heaven in the name of Jesus because of what he has done for me. Not what I could possibly do to earn that. And now I'm in a place in my life where I have to decide. Does sin get the preeminent place in my life as the better choice of something? Or I go, you know what? I'm going to depend upon you, Jesus. I'm going to look in your Bible. I'm looking in your word. I'm going to talk to somebody who's got some wisdom. And I'm going to say, what is the better approach here in Jesus? Why doesn't your life and my life more often depend on the better in Jesus Christ? Why don't we just depend upon him to make things better? Because there's going to be a tempest flying all over the place. We're doing Life of Christ course on Wednesday nights. And, and we're in that place in his second year of ministry, near the second half of the second, minute, uh, second year of Jesus' ministry. And all kinds of stuff is going on. And I use that as a little bit of a devotion. Our men's uh, prayer last yesterday morning, I said, you know, it's amazing. Jesus got away. He's up in the mountain. He tells the people to go away. The context is in Mark 6. And he's there. And and. and and then the disciples, you say, just go on the boat, get over to the other side of the sea, and the people go away, and I'm going to go pray. And then it says there, he saw them toiling in the water. You see, Jesus Christ knew exactly where the disciples were the whole time. That right there make you better, child of God. He knows your state. He knows your status. He knows what you're going through. And you and I think sometimes that I can just settle for less in life. Well, gosh, we may be treat, cheating God of what he has for us. It may be just that you're going to grind it out a little differently. You're going to have more people to share the gospel with. I'm not talking about maybe. But if, you, but if you have the capacity to have a great business where you can bless people and then give monies away to missionaries or you just can give 100 people a job, do that. Don't settle for just nothing. If God's giving you the capability of doing things for others and being advocates for others and standing in their place to help them, then do so. Why in the world would you and I give up on the life that God's given us? He's given us a life to live in him. You see, sometimes we just forget the very simple, basic thought <laughs> that less is definitely the contrary of more. Less is the contrary of more. You say, duh. But believers, sometimes you don't realize you're being tempted on a daily basis to lower your be better standard founded upon Jesus Christ. Why should I really spend any time in the Word of God? I know quite a bit already. Well, I'll spend some time in the Word of God because somebody told me a good devotion in the morning for 10 or 15 minutes will make my day be better. Okay? That right there is selling God short. Does it mean that that's wrong? No. It means it's good, but it's the less. It's settling for less. You wouldn't settle for less if the coach said, you have a good outing today, and you're going to be my number one starter. You're going to have a chance to pitch and start every game that is important. 
you start working on being better. If you were told at work that there is a thousand dollar bonus if you can produce a little more work between Thursday and Friday, you're on it. Because that thousand dollars could help something or someone or anything in your family. But see, sometimes we look at things and we're tempted to say, ah, since we're dealing so much in the flesh place or the carnal place, we don't realize God is saying, I want you to be better in my son. That's why I sent him for you. First, to be saved, and second of all, to have a life fulfilled in the purpose that I called you to. The world is pulling out all the stops on the church. It's coming after the church, too. It's been coming after the church for 2,000 years, saying, hey, Laodicea, Philadelphia, Thyatira, they're all found in Revelation 2 and 3 in Smyrna. Hey, churches, if you had the ear to hear, you got to listen to the Spirit. He's speaking. Church, there's a pushback against us. And it is for you and I collectively as a church to settle for less in the flesh than to be better in Jesus Christ. What's the settling for less? Put on a couple of good messages. Get a couple of good activities. Don't invite or don't have the presence wherewithal to really have Jesus Christ be at the center of it. Or he gets a chance to get a tip a little bit instead of saying, wait a minute, I need to pray and get a little bit closer to the Lord. I need to have a really, truly strong, spirit-filled strategy of how this particular gathering is going to go. To pray over what the young families will look like. To pray over the studies that they're doing. Going to the book of Ephesians and now doing something on stewarding their lives. Is that correct? Is that what you're doing? Stewarding your lives. It would be a great thing to learn at a young age. How, how do we do life and steward things of God? But you're getting pushed back, church, and we're getting pushed back collectively. Say, hey, just do some good stuff, get a lot of people to come, and everything's going to be fine. No, 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 no. We are the church, the body of Christ. We belong to Jesus. He is our example and our way, and he is better, and we ought to be better. It says up there, thirdly on the screen, when you think about this whole thing, that People come into our lives sometimes. It says up there, they enter into your life and they subtract God's virtue, God's strength, God's purity, God's goodness in you. And it's an attempt to lessen your surety of value in your father. What do I simply mean is this. Many people that are believers, or maybe they're lost, but they come into your life, they see that you have something of God, they see that it's very attractive, and they want what you have, and they want their lives to be better, but you give them something that they need to do, like some homework, like, you need to go after this. I'm going to share with things with you, I'm going to spend some time with you, but when you leave this moment, you need to do something about your life, because you have a personal responsibility to be better in Jesus Christ, just like I do. But a lot of people come into your life, not everyone, but a lot of people come into your life, and they sometimes just subtract God's virtue in you. And then you start wondering, God, do I have enough? God, I'm tired. God, I'm worn out. And you're the mature believer. You've been following the Lord and serving God for year upon year. And I understand. And so we have to continually walk through that type of life relationship with people. Because, very simply, we want to point people to Jesus Christ to be better. We do not want that place of our lives where we're interacting and doing the work of the ministry the way that God has called us to do it. And then say, ah, it's just too much. It can be. Because sometimes there are people that just want to live their life, spiritually speaking, vicariously through you. And that can be tiring. And what you need to do in making disciples and mentoring people and training them. When they're in your lives, just say, I'm going to keep on pointing you to Jesus. I'm going to keep on pointing you to the Word of God. I'm going to keep on pointing you to the principles of the Word of God. I'm going to keep on teaching you things that will make you better. But it's going to be Jesus Christ. You may give me a little bit of credit, but I don't want that kind of credit. Because guess what? We'll get caught up and we'll start losing as mature believers that surety of value in the Lord. That virtue comes from God. That value comes from God. And we need to know that, hey, people can have an influence in our lives as much as we want to have an influence in them. 
We need to stay close to being better in Jesus Christ. Because consequently, many spiritual, spiritually famished, famished children of God have decided to forsake be better and settle for be worse. That's a scary place to be. In this series that we're in, just for a, a couple of, uh, just a few weeks, last week I talked about the challenge to be better. It is a challenge to be better. There's a lot of things that stop you from being better. And today, I want to put before you, you can't settle for just a little bit less and a little bit less instead of saying, I'd love to have more from the Lord. I'd love to have more from the Lord. Children of God, you and I have an incredible place in God's heart. We are his children. Go to Romans 8 as I put up a couple of verses on the screen. The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. You are a child of God, born again believer. If you're lost this morning, you do not know Jesus Christ as your savior. You've never spent that moment, time area, it was just a few things going on in your life and you said, God, you've got my attention. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I want to be forgiven of my sins. I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. I believe that you came for me and you died and you were buried and then you were rose again according to the scriptures and I believe in the gospel and I understand it's for by grace that I'm saved through faith not of myself it's the gift of God not of works lest any man should boast well then the Bible says if thou shalt believe in thine heart and confess with thy mouth thou shalt be saved the Bible's clear that as a person who's lost you need to become a child of God and be forgiven of all your sins and be redeemed and as a child of God now you have this incredible new life and you can be better because the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit it says in Romans 8 21 because the creature itself also shall not be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God you and I are children of God Again, in Romans 8, let me just read a couple things and just highlight it. Starting in verse number 14, Romans 8, some great truth here, some sweet surety from God. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. He's speaking to the believer. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. We read that earlier. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, join heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Here it is, verse 18, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. We are the children of God. And us, peoples, together as a church, we should say, okay, God, we want to be better as a church. Individual believers, I want to be better as an individual. I want to walk with the Lord closer. I want to be better. I want to say, okay, God, what would you have for me? And the only way that's going to happen to be ready, pro be better properly is for me to see the word of God and how God sees me. Now I can bounce back and say, I see you clearly. You are a God of righteousness. You are a God of grace. You are a God of goodness. You are a God of forgiveness. You're a God of justness, and you are the one that is just, and I will follow what you say in your word. It goes down further in verse number 20, for the creature was made subject to vanity, not willing, but reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Read this earlier. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Whew. But not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, and we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to with the redemption of our body. We are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For man seeth, why doth he yet hope? But if we hope that for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. We are the children of God, it says in Galatians 3. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus.
children of God, we don't need to be spiritually famished. The Spirit of God can work in us. The Word of God can work in us. And we mention it oftentimes. How do I become better? I need to recognize who can make me better. I need to be better with him. It's a simple principle found in 1 John 3. In this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. It goes back to the, the one that wrote that, Apostle John, that says, Hey, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, that you have love one for another. Greater love hath no man than this. He lay down his life for his friends. I have a new commandment that I give you, that you love as I have loved you. That's what's being said there as believers when we are in a place of letting Jesus allow us to be better, we can have that kind of love. We can have that kind of Jesus love for others. In order to be better in our faith walk tomorrow, the children of God must acknowledge who the better really is today. In order to be better in faith, in our walk, in our faith walk tomorrow, the children of God must acknowledge and realize right today, beyond the 45 minutes of this message, the 15, 20 minutes of praise, the Bible class that we already had, maybe you'll have some more later, Beyond that, I need to acknowledge who. Because I am tempted to settle for less. Why would I settle for less? Because in my nature, in my way, the way I want to do this, when I ask you that again, as it's up on the screen, why settle for less? Because I'm quickly to forget, as a child of God, how he loves me. And how I can then love him back. Because the Bible says we love him because he first loved us. The Bible says in 1 John that perfect love casts out fear. Fear has torment. The idea of being lost and thinking that hell might be my eternal destiny got me to a place where I considered the scriptures and what it said about Jesus redeeming my soul. Believers, again this morning, I ask you, why settle for life outside the living word of God? Why settle on something outside of Jesus? Because we still have this stuff. Though the Bible says that we have victory over it, though the Bible says that we do not have to give it place at all, that we're cut away from it, that we are redeemed from the flesh, we somehow reawaken it. Why do I settle sometimes that way? Instead of having a life based completely in being better in Jesus Christ, my master and my king, because I forget that he is the one that truly can make me better. When you think again, be better. You say, be better. It goes back to that verse that then is resonating throughout the whole book of Hebrews. Being made so much better. Once salvation hit, then began you being better. And if things are a little bit worse today, decide that tomorrow it can be better in him. Hebrews chapter number 7. Let's just break down a few little lessons point for just the next few minutes and see how Jesus Christ, as he is better, can then ignite and instigate and motivate and push me to say, Jesus, I can be better because you can make me better. I'd rather be better in you than to be better in me. I'd rather be better this way than my way. The same verses that applied when you were considering getting saved. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Well, that's the way you ought to live your Christian life, right? That makes you better. Oh, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Oh, so maybe I should just stick with that formula. 
Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man come unto the Father but by me, he says. That will then give you relationship with the Father through Jesus Christ, the ministry of reconciliation. That's what the gospel does. But now that you're born again, now that you're saved, you say, that's very basic. That's just basic Bible stuff. I wonder if we've lost track of the basics. Or, or we know them so very well, we just take God for granted. In Hebrews 7, this message for just the next few minutes gives us just some, whoo, Jesus is better. Whoo, Jesus is better than that. Whoo, Jesus is better than that. He is better. And there's no settling with Jesus. I don't want to settle with Jesus. I don't, Jesus will not let me, if I really give him, my time and my energy. If I really give God my life and say, hey, I know what's ahead of me is me messing up. But beyond that, you're going to make things good. You want to make me to be like your son, Jesus. That's what you want to do, God. I understand what it says. That you predestinated me to be conformed to the image of Christ after my salvation. You want to continue to work in me, as we say often. Look at Jesus Christ as being superior than the angels, the prophets, Abraham, Joshua, Moses, and everybody else. And we're saying, we have this life that can be better. Then why would I not then simply plug into his way, his truth, and his life? Because I'm a hardhead and I need to get back in, refreshed, spend a few more minutes, give up an hour of sleep, spend time with him during the day. Put on the word of God through an app so that I can listen to it in my ears. I know there's some good messages out there, but what if we listen to the Bible being spoken for 15, 20, 30, 40 minutes every day? If we went through the book of Deuteronomy, we went through the book of First and Second Chronicles, I know that you should be reading it in front of you. I understand that. What if I was memorizing a verse every month and another verse every month and another verse every month? What if I was deciding to go on a mission trip? What if I decided to go to a young family's uh, Sunday group and, and learn some of their studies? What if I was to go have my kids go to youth group? What if was I was just to, just to just go further and say, God, show me how to be better? And Jesus Christ will be right around the corner and say, I will eclipse everything in this life that you thought was great. And I will give you comfort and peace when you're in the midst of a turmoil, difficult, tempest time on, this, on the sea. I will be there for you. I will forgive you. I will redeem your time if you allow me to because you have to put it in front of me and allow me to redeem it. You will allow me, I know, Lord, to have a better life if I would just let you and so often, I forget, and I have to go back to the Word and realize that there's no one like you, Jesus. You are better. You're better than everything that I ever, ever could have. You've always been better. You have a better Word. You have better wisdom. You have better thought. You have a better mind. You have better, better everything. And how is this, as I get older, it becomes more difficult because I am full of myself, just like so many of us. And pride does come before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. And I don't want that kind of life near my end. I want it to be better. And I want it to be better for my children. I want it to be better for my grandchildren. I want it to be better for you. If all I had left was another few minutes or a few hours, I would just tell you, live your life in Christ and be better in him. And it will be worth everything. And whatever you think you lost, it cost you something. It cost you nothing compared to Jesus Christ. You will lose nothing more than he lost for your sake and for your soul. And we think something better is to keep, it's to give it away. Give it all away for Jesus Christ, and he will give you back stuff that you never could dreamed of. The Old Testament guys, they thought they had it together until Jesus showed up, and he said, I'm the better priesthood. I am the better foundation. I am the better fulfillment. I am the better sacrifice. I am the better covenant. I am the better everything. Get out of my way and let me do what I've been called to do. Without one ounce of sin in his soul and not one ounce of malice in his mind, 
He came for you to die on a cross so that you could have a better life in Jesus Christ. Do not forget what you have in Jesus Christ this morning. Do not forget how much better he is than everything they did in the Old Testament. Put down your pharisaical ways and live for Jesus Christ. Put away all the things that you thought were so much better to make everybody think you were some holier-than-thou person. Live in Jesus Christ and you'll be better. That's how Jesus Christ told us in Hebrews chapter number 7 to be better. He is going to make a difference if you allow him to make you be better. It says in verse number 11, in verse number 12, it therefore perfection whereby the Levitical priesthood, <laughs> for under the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest? We have the order of Melchizedek, and not be called after the order of Aaron, for the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. It says up there on the screen, Jesus Christ better. Jesus is, is better priesthood. You know what? Very simply this. You cannot and I cannot, unless we want to continue to do it. So we can settle without Jesus, but you cannot settle with Jesus. If you think you're going to just coast and put Jesus in it, he won't let you. He will make you miserable in a good way because he'll want you to come back. Because of Jesus's, Jesus Christ's better priesthood, you know what it says there? He comes, he's the better priesthood, he is the man. He is the mediator between God and man. The man Christ Jesus. You thought that I took it out of contest. He is the man. 1 Timothy 2.5. And he is the royal priest. He is the better priesthood. They have Melchizedek. Try and study him out and figure it all out. There's something divine about that. There's a lot of people that comment about that. The bottom line is he was better than Melchizedek. But you can't have the better priesthood unless you have a better law. Because you need to fix the law. The law is fulfilled by Jesus Christ. It was a feeble law, though it did its job as the schoolmaster. I'm not saying throw the law out the door. Absolutely not. But Jesus Christ is the better priesthood. And the law is good. And the law is right. And the law is for us. But Jesus Christ said, the law made nothing perfect. Do you understand that? Verse 19, real quick to go ahead. The law made nothing perfect. I did not make it up. God's word says it. So if the law cannot make anything perfect, but Jesus Christ can perfect you, fulfill everything in you. Perfect is in the absence of sin as you think and absence of errors. It's him saying, I will perfect you. I will complete you. I fulfill my work in you. The Old Testament priests, they could not do this stuff. They knew their ministry was incomplete. And they were waiting because they knew Jesus Christ had to come. Because of Jesus Christ's better priesthood, there's no settling with Jesus. Verse number 13 and 14. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe, of which no man gave an attendance to the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning the priesthood. Our next one, it is very simple. It says right there on the screen, no settling with Jesus because of Jesus Christ's better fulfillment. He fulfilled the law. You can't just change the law for the fun of it. Well, I just feel like, you know, I just need to make God's word fit me. That's what Jesus, Jesus had to fulfill the law. So as he fulfills the law, it's better fulfillment. Well, how does that even work? If you, if you do not do something about the law, then you can't have anything to be done about the priesthood. Then if you do not do something about the lineage of Jesus Christ, so he comes out of the lion, out of the tribe of Judah, then it's going to be wrong when you see the genealogy. But it was right because Jesus, who is the royal priest, he is the high priest, he is the divine priest from glory, who is the better priesthood, has a better fulfillment. He fulfilled the law. And if he fulfilled the law, then why do we have the law? Oh, so you can go ahead, just, just cancel it out and throw it away. No, 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 no. That's not what we're saying here. You and I think, oh, well, you know that law thing, we'll just throw it down the toilet. No! The law of Moses did not make any provision for the priesthood from the tribe of Judah. We know that. But the high priest came from the tribe of Judah, so we know that's nailed down. Now this new arrangement comes. And it doesn't say, okay, because the law is fulfilled and we have something better than the law that was imperfect, that Christians can just say, ah, I don't have to live by any laws. No, <laughs> the New Testament has a lot of commands for you. 
<laughs> it says a lot of stuff about you and I following in order to be better in Jesus Christ. It would be something that would be actually like really refreshing. Colossians chapter number two, I won't take long, but Colossians chapter number two, some of you know where I'm going there. Colossians chapter number two, verse number 13 and 14. And you, believer, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Believers, you're forgiven. All your sins and trespasses and wrongs are forgiven under the blood of Jesus Christ. Now you need to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Not work so you can get saved. Work out your salvation now with fear and trembling. Every day. God, it is you which worketh in me, both the will and to do of your good pleasure. I want to grow in you. I want to be better tomorrow. Be better the next week. Be better the next one. Give us some time. You might wake up when you're about 70 years old and go, I think I'm starting to get better. But I can tell you, Jesus Christ will make it better in a lot of ways a lot sooner. Because, believer, your sins are all forgiven. Verse 14, it says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. He got rid of all the ordinances that were against us which were contrary to us. And he took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. He took all the law and nailed it to the cross. You wonder what he did with the law? He nailed it to the cross. You're free to obey and do what he'd have you to do to please him because you love him. Every parent in this room understands that. I want my kids not to obey me because they're afraid I'm going to punish them. I want them to obey me because they love me. What do you think your Father in Heaven wants you to do? Just love me. I've got your best interest at heart. It may not seem that way right now. It might, but Jesus, I sent him to be the fulfillment of everything, and it's the better fulfillment. A lot of others tried to come before him. There's no one like him. He's the better priesthood. He's the better fulfillment. And then it says in Hebrews chapter number 7, picking it up in verse number 15, and it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude... The simile of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest who is made not after the law of the carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. Ooh, 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 ooh. Don't let that go past you. Verse number 17. For he testifieth, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So after he replaces and makes it better, what's it say up there? a little delay there. Beep. No settling with Jesus because of Jesus Christ's better foundation. What do you mean? Jesus sets the foundation for the better life that's eternal. Immediately, believer, right now, for about 10 seconds, think. You call on the name of the Lord to save you. You know you're saved. You know you're born again. Do you know that it's eternal life? Eternal life. Eternal life. That's what the Bible says. It says there, an endless life, but after the power of an endless life. So it wasn't a carnal commandment or a, man, a, a commandment that was made for man. It's not a wicked, sinful commandment. It is a, a carnal commandment, a man commandment. He was not made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. Jesus Christ, as the priest, was made for eternal, endless power life. He has everything set for you. You can be better in that. Now, are you going to have emotional difficulties, feelings that are going to come up, thoughts that are going to play with you, questions about things? Yes. But when you look at stuff like this in the Bible, I'm not making it up. It's right here. You're better in Jesus because he makes things better. Be better because he's better. Do you know that you have the same ingredients to be better as Jesus Christ had when he came to battle against the devil in the wilderness and got tempted when he had fasted and prayed? The spirit of the Lord and the word of God. Jesus used the word of God, did he not? And he says, it says in Luke 4, that the spirit moved him into the wilderness and the spirit was in him as he went into the wilderness. You have that. 
You and I as believers have that. I, but I don't suggest tomorrow that you wake up and go, okay, devil, where are you? We're, you know, we're going to go at it today. How, how's that sound? You want to go at it today? Yeah, I wouldn't necessarily invite him. But if you're after it with the Lord and you're being better, he might send someone after you. But Job, it was said, was a righteous man. Noah was a man that it says was found graced. I would say that Jesus' better foundation is a good thing. Jesus Christ and his, <laughs> everything that's better in his priesthood and his fulfillment. The last couple and I'll be done. Here you go. Verse number 18 and 19. For there's verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. Hey, <laughs> the disannulling of the commandment, <laughs> you know? We got to work through that commandment stuff. Verse number 19, I mentioned it earlier, for the law made nothing perfect. Why did, what, what? It's in the Bible. He makes everything perfect. But what happens here? But the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we are drawn nigh unto God. The better hope, that's Jesus Christ. Because of Jesus Christ's better hope, you don't have to settle. He won't let you settle. He's your better hope. What does better hope mean? Then when God says, I'm going to allow somebody to take something away from you, you can still say it's going to be okay. And it's not flippant. When things happen around you that are tragic, you say, the law made nothing perfect. But I need to find out what law he's using in order to punish me. Stop. 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 The principles of the word of God are real and true. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. If you want to know scientifically and in nature and in math and, and everything, but most of all in God and the way he's got things set up, certain things return certain things. And if they don't, it's because God is just gracious and merciful. If the chubby little guy, not saying it bad, decided to run a marathon next week, I promise you I'll have a heart attack and you guys can say nice things at my funeral. That's a guarantee. My cholesterol is about 950. My blood pressure, I don't know. They don't even have something to register. I'm just joking. I'm healthy. I'm fine. I actually am entering a marathon next week. Look at they're all quiet out there. I'm just joking. But here's where we're going. We're so considering what will happen to me when he brings the lightning bolt out of heaven to mess me up. Again, the principle of the word of God is true. That's fine. I'm going to believe the word. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto thy own understanding. When I lean on my own understanding, I'm not trusting God. I'm in so much trouble. Bam. Now I have doubts. Now I have wonderments. Anybody ever had any doubt this past week about things and how they were going to go? Maybe because you didn't trust the Lord. How would I know that? Because I've done it. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's a nice verse. I don't know if I believe it or not. Wait, 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 wait. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. So faith is something that ends up coming as I trust in the Lord. I take a move by faith. I put the word of God into play. Jesus says I can be better in that instance, and I can have some peace and calm. See, that's how Jesus makes things better. Peace. Faith. Everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be all right. Oh, but, 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 but. I won't say anything other than to have you understand what this is saying very simply is the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did. Thank you, Jesus, for being our better hope. He is the better hope. Verse 20, 21, 22, and in so much as not without an oath, he was made priest. And of course, it goes into verse number 20, and those priests were made without oath. <laughs> but this was with oath. Very simply, it was the word of God is the oath. Jesus Christ has made an oath. There's an oath that before the foundation of the world, the lamb was slain. There's an oath that's been made by holy God. None of the priests to this point had ever had to go into the priesthood and be that priest by oath. It was by lineage. 
It was by inheritance of the right that God bestowed. It says here, though, that Jesus, the high priest, the Lord swear and will not repent. Thou art priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Verse 22, by so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. Very simply, it says up there, and it's a great verse, because of Jesus Christ's better covenant, there's no settling with Jesus. The word testament very simply equals covenant. God made a covenant with you and me through the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It was by his word that he spoke it. It's an oath of God. Verse after verse after verse after verse in prophets. And, pro and it says in Hebrews 1, he spoke in sundry times and divers manners about all that was coming to be with the prophets. But then Jesus came and it was a better way to speak because he's better than the prophets. And then verse 4, he's better than the angels. And I said before, and he's better than Abraham, and he's better than Joshua, and he's better than Moses, and he's better than the law, and he's better than Melchizedek, and he's better than all the priestly lineage. Every single old covenant priest that there ever was, he's better than them. Every person in Hebrews 11, the hall of faith, he's better than them all. He's better than everyone because by oath he came and he became the priest, the divine priest from glory. And that's why the Jews failed because they rejected him as the sacrifice, the better hope, the new covenant, the better covenant. Oh, you're a good master teacher. You're Rabboni. We'll take that. You could be king. We'll name you king. Are you not king of the Jews? They mocked him. But they would never say that he was the priest. That's why he came for them. To shed his blood on that cross for a sacrifice that they could not pay. Lastly, and we're done. Verse 23, and they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, but this man, because he continueth ever hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. If you would just memorize a couple verses this week, memorize those. He is the better salvation. That's why you cannot settle. You cannot in any way, shape, or form settle with Jesus. You can settle contrary to Jesus, but when you say you're with Jesus and I want him to work things through, then you'll not be able to settle because he's going to tell you that I'm the one who made you and I made the better salvation work. And my salvation is eternal. My salvation is complete. My salvation is perfect. My salvation is all you need. Jesus Christ, it says there in verse number 25, he is able also to save them to the uttermost. He can save anyone, anything, any such, I mean anyone, any person that's in anything that's awful, any debauchery, any sin, any, you think that you've done something that he doesn't know about? He knows everything about me. He knows everything about you. And he says, you come to me. You come to me. Lay down your life. Repent of your wicked ways. Ask me to forgive you, and I will send you forgiveness and a better salvation. You'll never, ever regret it. You'll never, ever go back on it, because I'll never go back on my better salvation. I am the better salvation. I am the better hope. I am the better covenant. I am the better priesthood. I am better in every way, shape, or form. Why would I not, as a believer, tie into that? Why not I not just live my life to be better and give it about 50 years? And stop being so anxious that something didn't be better this week. Do not then acquiesce and backpedal and go, oh, my life is worse. God, I want your son to make me better. Show me in the word of God. Well, how about if you read this week the book of Hebrews? It'll mess you up and you'll have a good time. Read chapter 7 a few times. And you realize how much he loves you. How much he cares for you. The whole conclusion of this matter, just like Solomon. <laughs> he is the ever-living, unchanging high priest. And he's able to save to the uttermost. Oh, what a savior we have, Jesus.
It says up on the screen this as we go to invitation. Our time right now, music's going to start playing. You can go ahead and start now, just nice and soft. I'm going to pray. I want you to ask yourself this question. Why have I settled for less than a better life in Jesus Christ? I've said it a hundred different ways. I'm sure the Holy Spirit has been doing it a whole lot. He always does it better than me. That's who makes things better. And as we play some music and after I pray, there's an altar place here. I invite you just to come, grab a little, little spot. Just a little spot. Nobody's going to embarrass you. A little spot. Or right there in your seat. And just talk to him. And say, I don't know why I've settled for less than a better life in Jesus today. I've got to turn that around. And if you never called in the name of the Lord to save you, I'll hang out up here afterwards. And you can come up here very quietly. And I'll be more than happy to sit and visit with you. Father in heaven, we come to a time that's very precious in our service like they all are, every moment is. Over the last few minutes, we've got into your word. We've had some beautiful singing and praying. We've had music, and it's been sweet. And now, as we acknowledge Jesus, thank you. Thank you for making my life better. And in every case that I've ever asked you, you've made things better, even when I thought they weren't going to be or they couldn't be. Thank you. Thank you for teaching me so much and being so patient with me. Thank you for your long suffering. I pray for the souls of the people here, believers that are redeemed, that they would spend some time with you and for those that are lost. Maybe today will be the day. Work on the hearts of these people in Jesus' name. Please stand and please act as you would. We'll just take a minute or two. I preached for a little bit, but why don't you come? Why don't you come? Nobody will bother you here. You come and pray. Come and talk to the Lord or just in your chair. Maybe you want to pray with your spouse or pray with someone right there. Please come. Act upon the Lord's urging.